All right, everyone. The assignment has been posted to the um, to Canvas. And um, essentially, this is going to be continuing on that idea that we ended um, that we ended class with the idea of thermodynamic versus um, kinetic control. Um, so it's going to, it explains the procedure a little bit. Basically, we have two possible reactions that can happen. Um, and they're not using functional groups that we are used to dealing with, um, mostly because these are really, we wanted to make two products that um, are easily identifiable and where one is favored by kinetics and one is favored by thermodynamics. Um, so that's what we're what we're looking at here. Um, so we're we have the reaction happening here is we have a cyclohexanone and a molecule called furfural. Um, and they'll be reacting uh, together to give us a semi-carbazone is the name of the molecule. Um, and so I, I gave you the procedure. <clears throat> and so part one is going to have you um, undergo a known, a known reaction. And let me... The, let me go back to the lab file. Um, and then the second file is some data from last year. It says, okay, these are, these are the reactants that were mixed for part one. Here are the observations and what temperature it was, this occurred at. Here's the mass of product. And then it has, gives you the melting point of the product, which is this, this is one of the reasons why we use the, this particular reaction. Um, is that we want to, the two possible products we're going to be looking at have very different melting points. And so that's gonna allow us to tell the difference between did we, which product did we make? Um, and then it has you go through a couple different experiments where it, where it does things at um, 80 to 85 degrees Celsius and then um, where it has reaction happen on an ice bath. And then, so your, the procedure itself, you're just going to read through the procedure given and then um, use that and the results that I give you to answer the report questions at the end. And it says, okay, so for, based on your results for part three to five, draw a potential energy surface for both reactions. So that's going to be the one that looks like what we, end, what we ended class with, where you have, where one of your reactions is going to have a lower transition state and not be as favored. And your second reaction may have a higher transition state, but then be more favored by thermodynamics, by which I mean the more downhill in energy is going to be more favored at equilibrium. So a reminder that low temperature favors the kinetic product, the one with the lower barrier. Higher temperature favors the one, the product with, that's more downhill in energy, favors the thermodynamic product. All right, so that's that's what you guys are going to be working on here. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about as you get to them. Um, refer back to this procedure that's given though for most of your information. Um, and this is um, this is somebody's actual data from last year, so it's possible that some things don't match up exactly. I'm not giving you perfect data. I'm giving you real data. Um, that said, this is very, 
it's pretty well organized and it's um it's eva fuller's data and so those of you know who, who know eva know that it's probably the right numbers um but no guarantees there everybody makes mistakes and then the other thing we we're going to do before i just turn you loose on that let's let's do some review with these reactions just for practice so i'll give you guys a few minutes if you haven't gone through them yet and then uh, i'll work through these All right, so for this first one, a peroxy acid. Peroxy acids make epoxides. So we'll start with, we'll start by making, and I guess it's not strictly speaking necessary to show the um, stereochemistry, especially since we'll get a racemic mixture of um, product, but it can be helpful just to remind yourself what the epoxide looks like. And then the second step is a ring opening reaction because that's pretty much the only reaction that we know of for these epoxides, right? So it's just a matter of what is our nucleophile. And in this case, our nucleophile is a methyl group. And so our methyl group is going to come in and attach to the less substituted carbon and break one half of that epoxide, break the epoxide, turn it into an alcohol. And so we wind up with something that's not gonna have any stereochemistry at the end, right? Because because we added a methyl group and it goes to the less substituted carbon because of the sterics. Uh, and this is happening under basic conditions because Grignard reactions always have to ha happen under basic conditions, we can assume our methyl is going to add to the less substituted carbon. So we wind up with two identical ethyl groups attached to that carbon in the middle. So this would be number one. Number two is really a bit of a throwback, right? Oxymercuration which normally would be a hydration reaction, but instead of expect, exposing it to water, we're expect, exposing it to methanol. So we're still gonna have four carbons. Oxymercuration puts an oxygen on the more substituted, it's a Markovnikov addition. So on the more substituted carbon, Except it's not just adding an OH, we're adding a methoxy group. And because it started planar, we have a 50-50 chance for either one of them. We should, we're gonna make both both enantiomers.
right? Or just show a mixture of R versus S. Sean, I have a question for the first one. Yeah. You said alcohol, but you left it as just an oxygen. Was, is it an oxygen or an alcohol? So if it was just an oxygen, that would be a deprotonated alcohol, right? Um, that's I just didn't bother to draw the the um, extra hydrogen on there because we don't have to show H's for skeletal structure. And since that's just what, how mole view defaults to showing it, I just didn't bother showing it, but it would be the alcohol um, because even if it's, it would have started deprotonated like this when you first do the ring opening reaction. Um, but then the last step where it gets exposed to water, what that water is going to do is protonate the, the um, oxygen. So we would just wind up with, with the alcohol. And last but not least, if we are not last, but the last one that where we start with one butene, we're going to make a peroxide again. By, and break the pi bond. Our nucleophile in this case, it's going to go through the ring opening reaction is going to be a sulfur group with a methyl attached. So we're gonna wind up with something that looks like this, we break open the pi bond. And again, last step is protonate. So we're gonna wind up with that being protonated um, plus an antimer. We have a chiral center here. So we can say that that's gonna give us both possible enantiomers with the oxygen up and the oxygen down. So if we have a, if an alcohol where you have a sulfur instead of an oxygen is a thiol, an ether where you have a sulfur instead of an oxygen would might be called a what? Take a guess. Isn't it rolls sulfide? off the tongue. Um, it would be considered a sulfide. You might see it described as a sulfide, but more specifically, um, we would call this a thioether. It's an ether with a sulfur in. So you just put the word thio in front of it. Um, and if you want another, another example that showed up in my research when I was working in grad school um, is, uh, so urea looks like this. If you replace the oxygen with a sulfur, it's thiourea. So and if you take cyanate and you replace the oxygen with the sulfur, it's thiocyanate. You take sulfate and you replace one of the oxygens with the sulfur on sulfate, you get thiosulfate. All right, so when in doubt, if it's a sulfur, just throw a thio in front of it. Um, I don't know what we, how you would name a thio or a thio ether. Come to think of it, though, I you wouldn't call it. You wouldn't name it as a. It wouldn't be thiomethoxy. There's going to be something though, um, but we won't won't bother with that right now. We can draw the product, and that's what matters. All right. Last but not least, we have an alcohol exposed to sodium metal. Sodium metal is a very good reducing agent, right? What is that going to do to an alcohol? Maybe deprotonate it. Deprotonates it, yeah. 
this is part of our, our Williamson ether synthesis, right? Deprotonate an alcohol and then use it as a nucleophile. So we deprotonate it, then use it as a nucleophile on this epoxide. And if it's a deprotonated alcohol acting as our nucleophile, it's going to be under basic conditions, right? Which means we still are just worried about sterics. So we're going to take the epoxide and we're going to attach the our um, oxygen from the epoxide is going to stay on the tertiary carbon and we're going to add a a cyclopentoxy group Any stereo centers there? Looks like there should be at least one. This is a complicated molecule, but can you find any carbons that have more than that four unique things attached? I don't think so. The, the two, the carbons that are attached to the oxygens are your best, best bet for having four unique things attached to them, right? But this one has two methyls that are identical. This carbon is going to have two hydrogens that are identical. This carbon has oxygen, a hydrogen, and then two directions that are identical around the ring structure. So if there was a methyl group on one side of the ring, now all of a sudden, now this carbon has four unique things attached to it, as does this other carbon. But if we don't have that, if it's just a cyclopentoxy group, then no stereochemistry. And that makes life easy, right? Apparently, apparently Bear Grylls, the Survivor Man guy, has his own uh, choose your own adventure on Netflix now. And he's eating gross things, apparently, according to what I'm the sounds I'm hearing from the uh, living room. All right. Any questions on the on the review reactions here? So remember with the ring opening reactions, the way we clarified it in class today was um, you're going, your nucleophile is going to attach to the, the less sterically hindered carbon. The only exception to that is if you're in acidic conditions and one of your carbons is tertiary, then your nucleophile is going to attach to the tertiary carbon. But that's a pretty narrow subset of reactions, right? So when in doubt, go with the steric answer. All right, then I think we're good to, you guys are good to go ahead and start working through the, the lab. Um, and go ahead and, and I will also clarify since I confused myself a little bit looking at my, um, at my lab right up here. A and B in the figure one are not the same as A and B down here. Those are two different molecules. The A and the B are just to distinguish in the caption what's going on. So in both of these, you're going to be reacting. These two semi-carbazones are, you're going to make two different semi-carbazones by reacting these carbonyls with a semi-carbazide. And the semi-carbazide is going to look something like this. Right, so I'm not saying that these two are reacting together. These are the two possible reactants, and we're they're going to react with semi-carbazide. Right, so those are the two reactions you're looking at: are A reacting with semi-carbazide and B reacting with semi-carbazide. Right, and so that's what you're going to be 
be producing in this reaction. All right, I'll let you guys get started on that. We'll hang out. I'll open up some breakout rooms if you want to, or just stay here and ask questions when you get to them. 